Hello everyone, so this talk is going to be in English. Um, uh, it's the last one in, in, in the English language, but it's, um, I'm not going to say the best one, but it's one that uh, both intimidates me and excites me. I'm really, really happy to uh, be sitting next to David Tremlett, uh, an artist you know very well, and whose work is in gallery G7 um, on the ground floor. Um, so David, um, is incredibly generous because we made him wait 45 minutes for his taxi and that's why we're a tiny bit late um, but we managed to um, to uh, book another uber and here we are so thank you very much sorry for you know for being so late with the talk but we're still very excited and um, first of all i want to take thank david for being here because you are preparing a very big um, wall drawing uh, for Hôtel de Sully, l'Orangerie de l'Hôtel de Sully. Uh, so David will be here for a few days and he's working really hard. So, you know, thank you so much, David, for making the time for being here. Uh, so we'll start right away. We've waited long enough. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, you know, about a very simple one, although my friend needs to leave in five minutes. Um, <laughs> so we, you were born in uh, and, you, and you grew up in a Cornish farm, quite removed from everything. And then you went to three different art schools and you ended up studying sculpture. Um, so tell us, a li and, and in the meantime, you met some beatniks and you kind of you know, little by little uh, developed a, a huge interest in art. How did that come about? And Thank why you. sculpture? Well, uh, you have to maybe close oh, to yeah. it. It all starts uh, in a strange way. My, my background was a farming background. Uh, my parents were relatively conventional, lower middle class, although my father had a bit of a sort of writing background. And he didn't enjoy farming. Uh, he tried to make my brother and myself join the farm, which uh, we clearly didn't want to do. Uh, at 16, my brother got on a boat and went to Australia, uh, where he started working uh, basically on the roads, crossing the Nullarbor Plain from Perth to Sydney. And I was fortunate enough to have a girlfriend at the time who was a bit sort of bohemian, and she took me down to visit her, some of her friends who were completely unlike my background, so they were, uh, they talked about art and they talked about, uh, I don't know, old, what they call skiffle music, and they all had long hair and long pullovers and utterly nothing that my parents knew anything about. And I, I loved it because it was completely unconventional. I was introduced to sort of Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and there was a writer there called Colin Wilson who wrote a book called uh, The Outsider. And this was all philosophy and l being a loner and a whole series of ideas which I had no contact with at all as a farmer's son. So uh, at that point I met a, a painter who was teaching in the local art college in Falmouth and he said, what do you do? And I said, well, I've got a lot of drawings and funny little carvings which I always chipped away as, as a kid, but I never thought anything about being an artist at all. I just enjoyed it. And we went off with my bits and pieces down to Farmouth Art College and I was told, uh, you're welcome to come. Uh, this was in the old days when you, uh, you didn't even need to have many exam passes to go to art college. You didn't need university or anything like that. If you were sufficiently um, interested in the subject with a bit of education, you were able to go. So I was accepted. And at that point, my parents realized that my brother was already in Australia. I'd found out some sort of vocation, so they thought. And they said, ciao, we go to Australia to join, join your brother. So at 18, they went off to Australia. Uh, and that's the last I saw of them for nearly 10 years. I was getting paid by the local council for everything. They paid my college fees. They paid my accommodation, etc. I did a general course uh, of which part of it was sculpture and that's really where the drawing side sort of enters it all because my tutor told me when you make a sculpture you have to draw it first you can't just chip away at a block of stone or a piece of wood you have to have an idea about what you want to do you you need to you know formulate it on paper 
And then eventually you can start modeling it or carving it or whatever you decide to do. And so, therefore, I was looking at the drawings of uh, Michelangelo, but also Henry Moore and Rodin and all the different other sculptors that were starting to be introduced to me, of which hardly any of them had I heard of. And at that point, I had to leave uh, Falmouth, and I went to another college in Birmingham, which was my first introduction to a, a big industrial city, a decaying city, in a sense, after the Second World War. And uh, I'd never seen a prostitute, I'd never seen a drunk, I'd never seen any of this sort of city life. And that was a sort of eye-opener. Uh, secondly, I was meeting also a lot of people who eventually became pop musicians, Brian Eno and uh, people from Traffic, the bands and some of these, uh, the Rolling Stones, etc. So it was a generation where musicians often ended up at art college at the beginning. Uh, they started off as painters or sculptors or something, but eventually they formed their bands and they went off and played music in, in and around the UK. And then after the the Royal, after Birmingham, I found myself going to the Royal College of Art in Art, the College of Art in London. Again, to my surprise, I just didn't realize I was capable of progressing through this college thing. I wasn't ambitious. I, I sort of stumbled into it somehow. I didn't, I didn't um, I mean, aim your, for Your it. teachers seemed to be quite surprised each time you moved schools, didn't they? Well, they were surprised that I was able to move schools. They always thought I was a bit of a failure, I think. And, uh, and, and maybe that was a sort of rebellious nature that comes from the fact that, you know, as I described these people I met at the beginning, my parents decided to leave, I had to fend for myself and all these sorts of things. And eventually, but anyway, that's not so, so important why I went to, from stage to stage. But the, the principle of drawing was now firmly embedded in me because I studied sculpture. And I was always drawing for it. I was always, of course, I was influenced by other things in those days, like, uh, I don't know, uh, Henry Moore, possibly, or some of the more minimal sculptors that were coming onto, <coughs> onto the sort of English platform. And so drawing was the one thing I always had. I had little books of them. The sculptures all got destroyed, but the drawings still existed. Drawing was this sort of simple way of having an idea and elaborating on that idea on paper. And if you needed to make it, you could make it. But if you didn't want to make it, you kept it as a drawing. And then in the seven, early 70s, I, I started to, you know, this, I left college in 1970. And I spent a lot more time in Germany. Uh, I, I worked with Konrad Fischer in Dusseldorf, and therefore I went Joseph Beuys and uh, all that sort of German uh, school, Uker, Richter, Polker, etc. They were always there, relatively sort of drunk and having a great time as artists. And whereas we back in England, it seemed to be you, if you were a successful pop artist, because remember that's the same time as pop art, but if you were in my sort of strange camp, so I was friends with Gilbert and George. Uh, Hamish Fulton, Richard Long, Art and Language, and people like that. We were slightly excluded from the general feeling of what was English art. So we came here to France. Uh, I worked with Durand Désert in the early days, uh, to Germany, to Italy, uh, Belgium, and Holland. And so my origins are very much European. That's why I felt European, not... Uh, not English, and <coughs> the consequent was I worked with a gallery in London in the very early 70s who I decided not to work with after a period. I then worked with somebody called Waddington for a period, but that's too, that was too formal for me. And since then I found myself exclusively working in Europe and to some degree the United States. And with that came drawing, always drawing. I never painted. I only drew, and my drawing then became, in some way, massive. It became walls and ceilings and floors. And this is really where sculpture comes into it. It became my sculpture, but I was drawing it. And do you mind if we go back to 1969 and the work, All You Need to, to Be an Artist? Um, so before, this was at the time where you had the exhibition at Grabowski Gallery, right? Uh, yes. And you weren't... Um, 
making drawings. It was more of a sculptural shapes with uh, graphite grease on them that would then go onto the wall. So it was starting to kind of go onto the wall. Can you tell us a little bit about this work? And, so and does it, because um, you seem to work with very little as well, so it seems to still apply to the way you work nowadays. Well, that particular little box was just one of three of an edition. And when I left the Royal College, I then decided to try and get a studio. My studio was in South London, in Camberwell, and it was an old railway arch. Underneath the railway stayed the lines. And all the other railway arches were occupied by taxi drivers <coughs> where they men mended their cars. And to produce some money to pay for my, uh, my studio, I used to work as a mechanic. And a lot of the residue from taxis and, and mechanics are things like grease, uh, all the muck and general stuff that comes out of, t uh, out of car engines, etc. And I started to use these car engine bits and pieces and assemble them in some ways, but not welding them, just sort of bolting them together. And grease was part of it. And I found grease was this strange sort of unpleasant material which normally is discarded and washed off and cleaned off as something that when I started to put it on a surface with the finger marks, etc., it worked as a, as a material. And so that little box contained some grease in it, some wire wool. Wire wool is this uh, wiry thing that you clean things with. Uh, two pieces of graphite stick and that was about it. So I call it all you need to be an, an artist. So you carry this thing around and you could <coughs> do something on the wall. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a joke, really. Uh, and then that second picture is uh, also I used to have a sort of strange ambition to search for things which were invisible. So the, the art of searching was really more a philosophy about life is about this endless search. Uh, and in my youth, I uh, tended to sort of crawl around the road on it, but it's a bit, a bit ridiculous. But it was, life was one of those humorous <coughs> sort of fluxus conceptual ideas of you know, you were able to be crazy, you were able to use art as a, as a, as a sort of poetry, as a acting, as, but it was art in a way, it was documented in photographs and things. I, while doing research for today, for, for our talk, I read, I seem to remember reading something about you being in the studio, completely static, and for so long, and in such, immobility that rats appeared and you learned something with them. Am I dreaming? Was I reading too much or can yes. you, do you remember saying that? That is also in this, in this railway arch which was pretty rat infested <coughs> and I would in the early days make uh, loop tapes with quarter inch tape you know which was uh, endless repetition. I was influenced by um, probably a little bit by uh, Steve Reich uh, a friend of mine, Gavin Bryars, who was a musician. So this idea to repeat sound was always quite interesting. And so <clears throat> I would sort of play these loop tapes and every now and then these rats would run by. So there was just a part of the activity which was, and you know, maybe there's a slight influence of Joseph Boyce in this because Boyce, who I met only once or twice, he was a rather strange and interesting man. And as a sort of ordinary Brit, it was, quite compelling what he was doing. So uh, I would say there was an influence of him in some of that. It what aspect of the of Joseph Boyce's work did, um, was it the, the work he produced or was it his message? It was, <coughs> it was his work. And the message I didn't really understand, this sort of shaman leader of people and all that odd stuff on chalk on uh, you know, school boards. I didn't really get all of that. I, what I liked was the fact that he came across as sort of utterly mad, and, but at the same time was a, a seriously revered artist. There was some mixture of these two things which made me, you know, I just was curious about how that worked. 
And you yourself uh, behave in quite um, an atypical way in terms of your career, because you encountered early success in London. So you did several exhibitions in London that sold, that were that had very good reviews. Guy Brett wrote about you, and it seemed to work pretty well. And then suddenly you decide to hitchhike to Australia. You lost your studio, and you decide to travel across the world. And it seemed to be a, a very um, important experience in the development of your work as well because you went across Africa and I don't know exactly where you were going to tell us and how that influenced um, the way you develop the work. Well, again, I, I think there are the, there is a sort of succession of how, how you develop as an artist. There's all this stuff in the studio with the grease and the mechanics and, uh, uh, and that uh, sort of fluxus way of living. But I realized that it was all a bit sort of messy and going nowhere. And I needed to somehow look at myself in a slightly different way. And one of the reasons I thought I could do that was by, hadn't seen the parents for 10 years, let's go to Australia. And I'd met very briefly Alighiero Boetti in Europe, uh, who was already uh, living a little bit in Kabul. And so I thought, I really would like to go through that part of the world. I'd never ever been there in my life. And the idea was, without much money, of how you get there. So I decided to hitchhike. And with the help of Fisher, who gave me 100 pounds, and somebody else gave me about 50, and in return for that 50, I sent them back postcards en route all the way through to Australia, I hitchhiked. And I managed to hitchhike all the way across to Delhi, and in Delhi, I was able to buy a ticket for the train for something like a dollar. And that got you all around India. Tried to get through Bhutan. I couldn't get through to um, uh, Burma because it was still closed or was closed. So came back to Calcutta, got a cheap flight with some of my 50 pounds to Bangkok. And then I worked all my, all my way all the way through the islands to Timor across to Darwin and down to Perth, where I managed to meet my parents. And uh, of course, my mother was saying, ah, oh, it's so lovely to see you, blah, blah, blah. And uh, of course, uh, I was uh, happy to see them, but I was quite happy to leave after two weeks because <laughs> I hadn't been used to them for 10 years and all that sort of thing. So I did a bit of a trip around Australia, came back, and they put me on a boat, and I came back home. And so there was a sort of sponsorship by one or two galleries for me to do that. I think they saw the sort of value in it as, a, as an exercise. And I think that was often the great thing of those galleries. They, they, they helped you do things which probably had no commercial value. They just helped you do it. Um, and so that's the story of Australia. Um, and um, Italy, so that country in Spoleto, they have a very, and um, Marilena Bonomo as well, so they have a very important role in your development as an artist. Uh, when did you meet them? When you, did you meet um, Bonom, the Bonomo Mario Gallery? Mario. And um, because we're in an art fair, so we're talking about drawing, but also I think the role of galleries as well in the, the life of an artist. Um, you had a very good and close relationship with her. So mm -hmm. was there a back and forth? Was there a, an influence? So I met her in Dusseldorf uh, at some exhibition, I think of Bruce Nauman or something. And <clears throat> I'd already worked with, it was at Fisher's Gallery. And she said, would you like to come to Bari? So I'd never been to Italy before. And therefore I took a plane from London to Bari. This is 1973. Uh, Bari was like the north of Africa, it had, it was very, very, uh, it was quite dangerous parts of Bari. Marilena was the most divine woman. She was elegant, she was gentle, she was cultured. Uh, she was extremely interesting as a character. She'd worked mainly with the, um, uh, some of the Arta Povera group, plus with Carl Andre and Mel, Mel Bochner and people like that. And so again, I was meeting one or two of these people I'd met in Germany, but I was now meeting them in Italy. And of course, Italy is, it's another, it's a divine world because it's, you know, not only do you eat well and you have a decent temperature, but there is a, a generosity in Italy 
which you don't find, well, you have, of course, the French are generous, and maybe the English are generous, I don't know, but the Italians are exceptionally generous in a certain way, and slow, and you don't quite know what's going to happen, but it then eventually does happen, and all those sort of qualities, uh, they always buy a work or two from you as an artist, which is such a thrill, because I didn't sell really anything at that time, just, you know, once in a blue moon. She introduced me to Giuseppe Panzer, so Panzer managed to buy some work for his collection. Uh, once I'd worked with her uh, and got to know, and that, remember, was the first city I ever went to was Bari. I didn't go to Milan or Turin, I went to Bari. And then after that, I met this man, Massimo Valsecchi, who was in London, but uh, was working in Milan and now runs the Palazzo Butera in Palermo. He became very important in the sense that he was the first one who would come to the studio and say, ah, I like this one and this one. Let's, let's make an exhibition of these five or six drawings. Or So I said, perfect. The drawings were taken to Milan and he would say, I will buy them all. Very kind, yeah. And then the next thing is, I don't intend selling them. So he would buy everything. He would give me the correct artist price, you know, Italian style. And then he would say, I want to keep them. And so if you go to uh, Palazzo Butera, you will see not just my work, but uh, many interesting artists that he did exactly the same with. He just kept them. And he sold occasionally one or two to a collector he recognized would never sell it again. And you also met Angelo Baldassaro as well? Baldassari. Valdesari, yeah. another collector, mm -hmm. um, and the relationship you had with those collectors, was it um, a dialogue? Um, because at the time, were you already making wall drawings, or was it more specifically works on paper? So what I called wall drawing at the time was actually usually done on graphite sheets of paper and done in sections. That's, in fact, what Panzer was buying in the old days. I don't know if there's anything there. They were not directly on the wall at all. Um, so. In effect, I was still just drawing. I was drawing as a, uh, as a sculptor with the, thank you for coming, as, as a sculptor. So, but I was not uh, drawing directly on walls at all with the exception of very, this sort of thing, yes. Where I was drawing, pinning it on walls and... Uh, and not using color at the time. Everything was black and white. Remember, that was the black and white. My photography was black and white. She's, Color photography was pretty much non-existent um, or very expensive, so everything was black and white. And, uh, you know, cassettes hadn't even appeared at that time. So we are talking about a whole different generation that you come from. Uh, uh, you know, and today is a, is a million miles away. But um, so, yes, and then uh, the, the people like Baldessari or Panza, no, there was no real dialogue. You would meet them, and uh, they would come and, and they say would hello. buy the work and support you as an artist. I'm, I'm assuming. Well, they were supporting the gallery to some degree. They were supporting a gallery and the artist. Of course, the artist gets his support, but the gallery would uh, certainly be very much part of that. Yeah. So, um, when did color arrive? Because I assumed it was related to Italy, because. Um, um, not unlike you, Saul Lewitt was very taken by Spoleto, and um, in the 80s he started started going towards very strong colors. First, you, uh, well, actually, no, it was the other way around. Strong colors came a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, so it was in Italy. Um, how did you introduce color, and does it have to do with wall drawings? and also the, in, the relation that the wall drawing might have with the landscape or the context it's produced for? Well, I would say all the color that it came at a point in the 80s when I'd been to some degree in Africa, also in and out of Australia in the Far East and other parts of the world. But it was the color of what I was now traveling in a lot more and being in. In Tanzania, for example, this in image. In Tanzania, all these, all, it, like this, these works here, the, these, these, yes, um, exactly, it works in abandoned buildings, basically. Yes, I, I, my test ground was often abandoned buildings, uh, so I, I obviously had not really done an awful lot on the built on the walls of 
uh, existing buildings in Europe, one or two, but not a lot. And so my sketchbook started to become abandoned buildings. But I, I was always very specific that the abandoned building, I needed to know who owned it. I didn't agree with graffiti as such. I thought the sort of di dis di discretion, di de no, what's the word? The when you draw on something without permission. Uh, I, vandalization? Uh, well, it depends what you do. But anyway, I, I always felt it important that you try and find out who owns it and go to that person and say, look, do you mind if I do something on it? I'll make some photographs, I'll send you some photographs. And in general, if nobody was available, then you sort of went ahead. But often I found out who it was and I would... So I would really enjoy making an addition to an abandoned building that was all sort of falling down and the forms were like architectural structures that were put underneath windows or on the sides of doors or they were supports they were new supports for this building that was falling down that was my my sort of um so there's reason a, for doing there's it. a lot of people who own photographs of your sketchbooks of your abandoned buildings and building sketchbooks around the world i'm assuming of my original sketchbooks no, the, the, you know, photographs like the, the one that I just <laughs> I, saw, because you contacted the owners. Ah, yes, yes, yes. No, no, the owners of... And how did they react? Oh, they just said, thank you, that's very strange. And then they, <laughs> there was a case in Texas when we did a building near, um, uh, down near Marfa, and there was a woman who had this building, and I called her, I found her out who she was through an estate agent who said the place has been on sale for 10 years, Nobody wants to buy it. So I said, can I have the name? So I wrote to this, or rang this woman and said, you know, do you mind if I do some drawings on the inside of this building? And she sort of said, sure, sure, sure. You know, why did you buy it? Uh, and I said, well, no, I'd just like to do some drawings if you don't mind, but we hopefully will publish a book. So I did the drawings. They produced a little book in Dallas with it uh, and, and, and this man, Valsecki. Uh, and we sent her a book, and believe it or not, she sold her house something like six months later. Uh, I don't know if it was due to my book, but uh, she certainly sold her house, so she, was, she wasn't, uh, wasn't mad about it. This takes me to a question of the, com the, um, the commissions, because again, we're in a not fair setting, so um, did you first work um, as um, in the response to commissions for private collectors or were your wall drawings first shown in exhibition spaces and is there a difference between both so they were yes they often made up part of an exhibition so you'd show some work on paper and then i would do a corner or a wall or part of the exhibition would be a wall drawing the idea being that <clears throat> i I love to make something bigger. So it, it's, it comes back to the concept of sculpture, that you, you do a drawing on a piece of paper that's relatively small, but the ultimate ambition is that it would be bigger. And so every, everything I do, I would say, on paper has the dream, my dream, of being bigger. Of course, the majority will never be bigger. And they might morph into something slightly different. But the dream is that everything that's done on paper is to be bigger. So it's that early principle of sculpture. You do a sketch for it, and then you make it. <laughs> and my life has been spent making all these things which, in a sense, are dreams that could be made bigger. And, uh, of course, when I'm dead and gone, it could be, uh, I don't know if Ferruccio is not here at the moment, but, you know, you have a good assistant who can help you out, and he has the understanding of how to make it. But I'm not like Sol, who had a perfect plan organized about the remaking of work. Uh, I've been much more, uh, it's uh, because it's pastel generally, there's a hand application, uh, it's more fragile, and there's a very specific technique that probably it will die with me to some degree, although I'm sure that there is a remake, retouch, re-element to it. And who knows, uh, with the modern technology, you'll probably say, ah, no, we can make that again. And uh, so. You can't replace the hand, can you? That, it's a very peculiar tech. So <coughs> could you please explain, because some people might not hmm. know, uh, you work with pastel quite a lot. So every, 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 everything you're seeing here is made with pastel. Pastel sticks. If you go to uh, Sully, Hotel de Sully, you'll see a big example of it <coughs> coming. It's uh, pastel sticks, which is rubbed on the wall. We, we use our hands and we massage it into walls. 
When the walls are extremely rough, then we use a bit of sponge to get it into all the pores of a rough wall. And then we just gently put our hands over it to sort of get that bit of wax that's in your hand onto it. But it's all rubbed in by hand. And we use tapes to get our straight lines and all these sorts of things. But it's, it's very, very much a sort of hands-on. I mean, these days I also paint, I have to say. I say I paint. I don't paint as a painter on canvas, but we do some very large projects on the outsides of buildings. Yes, yes that's a different in, kind of... I can't do that in pigment. I can only do that with acrylic paints. And so... Because it's in the public space, in, in, these are in often streets pub, and landscapes. In streets landscape. and public spaces, exactly, yeah. Where does this come from, <coughs> this um, gesture of touching the drawing um, material and applying it directly onto the wall? How did it come about? And uh, you can go back to your early days of sculpture and your plaster and your clay and your ceramics or whatever it was where you make something with your hands. And then I combine that with the fact that you go to places in parts of Africa, for example, or the Aboriginals in Australia, you see them smearing their colors on the sides of walls. There's a, it, it's, it's using the hand. I, I am someone who really likes to use my hands uh, to touch something. And I think that that sort of manipulation of color with your hands, it's very personal. But it's, it's something which is quite different from using a brush or using a sponge all the time or using this thing between. It's, it's a sort of hand. You use your finger. All the drawings you will see on paper, they're all made with my hands, only with my hands. Um, including the Tate um, drawing yep. for thinking. All by, it's all by hand. Thing. Yeah. It's quite a unique texture. It's very textural and quite um, almost velvety in some ways. Well, the wall obviously determines what sh how it comes. If you, if you did it on this piece of wood, it would look True. horrible. If you do it on that piece of concrete, it would look a little bit more interesting maybe. If it's on a primed wall in all depends. The Hotel de Sully wall is quite nice. <laughs> Every wall is slightly different. Uh, like some of them, I did that catalog once called If Walls Could Talk, which is actually coming from an old blues song. But, you know, they all talk a different language somehow. Do you fuse any kinds of walls, for example? How do you go about, uh, would you work on um, wood? I'm assuming not. No. You, you, you get it skimmed in plaster. You, you, you make sure it's got a bit of a gesso sort of a, a, a finish, if possible. Um, so going back to the, to the color and the shapes that you devise. So we saw those images in Africa where you were sort of exploring the shape of the building. Um, and then you started creating shapes that didn't completely respond to the building and kind of sometimes there's a project where you go um, on several floors and it's actually the sketch that is the complete drawing, but from floor to floor, you only see a bit of it. So how do you uh, work on those shapes? Are they still now related to the shape of the building? Or was that a starting point in Africa and in Tanzania? And now you have a sort of repertoire of shapes that you play with? No, I don't have a repertoire of shapes, because if you look at what I'm doing at the moment, it's changed quite considerably from previous ideas. I, I really believe in this notion of reinvention maybe every three, four, five years of where you're looking. I, I, I like to think of myself slightly as a writer or as someone who's composing uh, some something else. I need to recompose. The forms on buildings, for example, something like that, that's in France, that's in Nice. That's so beautiful. In, in, uh, in the hospital, believe it or not. Um, they I always had this attraction to architecture. If you look at what's going on here, it's architectural in a lot of ways. It's about balance. It's about forms being locked into each other. So go back to that next one. That's, that's the apartment of Lambert Wilson, the actor, in Paris. You can see this one in Paris if you know Lambert. And it's, it's, all, it's, it's, all, it's all about, lo that's a, 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 what you call it, it's a, it's where a, a musician called Ezio... It's an acoustic stage. Ezio Borso, a, a really good friend. Oh, this is something completely different. Yeah, this is a rubbish dump in Italy. So we'll, we'll talk about that later, but going so, back to... But e everything has this element of... 
it comes back into sculpture. It's about how you build something that is solid, that is balanced, that is the proportions are right, that how, how it all holds together. And all these forms sort of interlock and play and use each other in a sense of making sense. They're not random. They are a randomly composed, but they are very carefully put together so as they balance well. And so there's always a, you know, there you have corners, that's the Tate uh, on, on, on how it wraps around a room. So there is a long tradition of, of architecture in my thinking. And that architecture can be abandoned stuff in Africa, or it can be piano in um, Renzo Piano or something like that. Um, but you also transform and recreate the space completely in some of your wall drawings. And um, it's the first time I'm thinking of it. How do ar architects react to your work? And do you at times work with architects? I work with architects a lot. And what I find is that they often ask me to transform maybe what is a slightly dull room. If they, I mean, the worst one was Norman Foster. He hates anybody touching his walls. But <clears throat> if he does allow you eventually, he expects you to do something like in Bloomberg, completely radical that changes it totally. But in general, most of the architects I work with have been really interested to see what I can do with their room, especially the simple rooms. Um, but in this case, you're talking about maybe a collaboration uh, in, in building a new space. But if you um, work in a, a space that already exists, a private space or an, uh, a foundation, and the architect isn't aware of it, do you know how they have reacted to your work? No, I don't think most architects, I don't know. Yeah, architects are a peculiar lot. They can, they can be very arrogant in some ways, but... Uh, because like, I think Foster's got that sort of thing that he doesn't want anything. I remember a story. We were in Nîmes at the Carré d'Art in the early days when Guy Tosato was running it. And <clears throat> I was asked to do an exhibition which was on the top floor. And whilst we were installing this exhibition, a whole team of Norman Foster's uh, people came in because he designed that building. And they were making a movie about it. Uh, you know, and he basically asked uh, Guy, empty the place. I, want it, I don't want any art on any walls. I just want this empty building. And so he said, I'm sorry, upstairs, we're installing a thing. He said, well, therefore, we don't film anything upstairs. But the rest of it was completely empty so that Norman Foster could have his sort of pure walls. So there's some walls. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this was um, in collaboration with, with the borough, right? So, so it was a commission from the muni municipality. This is in Tuscany. Uh, it's near Pisa. And it was uh, one of my, if you can piece my history together, I have a, I have a huge s sympathy of reusing, if you can, what exists. I, I, I like to, I'm not a huge recycler of things, but I like to see that that particular street was a street, an occupied street by poor people, um, local people who... Uh, they were all retired. There was hardly a young person in this village. And the mayor came to me and said, look, I'm, I'm, I've got to regenerate this place somehow. We don't have an awful lot of money, but what do you think? And so he said, I've already done the road section. I put some new tiling down for the roads. And we looked at the buildings. I said, well, can you re-render uh, the exterior, exterior of all these buildings? Look at the windows. Look at the doors. Don't, you don't need to... So he actually re-rendered all these buildings and painted them white. And I did a selection of colors which on one side went from light green to dark green, and on the other side went from light, dark, from light red to dark red. And the, uh, once again, in Italy, you've got these small places like Burano near Venice and um, other you know, parts of the Cinque Terre, etc., that, that use a lot of color. And this place, I, I guess it has something to do with me, but hopefully not too much, it regenerated it totally. So the, it didn't even have a bar. It now has a bar. There's no restaurant in the place. We've been trying to get a restaurant moving if we can. There is an Airbnb and a bed and breakfast. Didn't exist before. 
and cyclists and tourists, and they come and they do all their selfies. It's you know everybody's like, doing like selfies. Like the Tate, like the Tate Wall, Every, which is the yeah, most you, selfied if you, wall. If you, if you type in Gizano, uh maybe put my name after it, you will just see hundreds of selfies of people against these cars, little girls being posing in it all. And the little barman is making money, and the bed and breakfast has got people in, and so there's a sort of little economy, and it kicks off that economy. It's this circular idea of economy. I, I, I'm, I'm very interested in that, that things don't get wasted and used. You don't demolish that and put some horrible buildings there. You use what you've got in an interesting way. And that's where this mayor, who is also responsible for that other one you saw of the rubbish dump, mm. Um, we've just come to a point where you pointed at the fact that these wall drawings and these interventions um, actually have a, a community aspect to them, especially when they're in the public space, but they're abstract. You're an abstract artist, and we've spoken about this before. Um, there seems to be less of an interest in abstraction. You come from a generation, of, as you explained really well, you know, of experimental musicians, musicians who went to art school, artists who were interested in working with sound. Um, so there's a, a lot of experimentalism that kind of got lost a little bit. And particularly in the UK, there isn't an interest or there isn't um, a tradition of abstraction in painting or drawing. Um, do you consider yourself an abstract artist or is there something else, another area? Because you, you kind of are at the confluence of conceptualism, minimalism and abstraction. Uh, but now we know it's 2023 and I'm sure you've revisited um, all of these movements and, and went beyond what they represented. Well, I clearly am abstract as opposed to doing realistic paintings of... Uh human bodies. There's plenty of people much better than me for doing that sort of work. My interest has always been abstraction, constructivism, Bauhaus, uh, all that goes around it, Joseph Albers, everything that has to do with a form and it's not telling me what I should be looking at but it's asking me to look, look at it. I'm not being, I don't give people stories. I have a story. I'm talking to you now with my story. Uh, that story is behind everything that's done. But the last thing I'm capable of doing is giving you that story in what I do. What I do is what I do. It's an interest in architecture, in color, in shape, in form, in sculpture, in constant drawing, in you know, I'm, I work my socks off every day of the week. I am not lazy at all. Uh, I love it. I seriously love it. But I'm not, a, I'm not there to give you um, some pleasure that is, that you can, f I don't know, feel that you relate to it automatically. My children, unfortunately, you know, they, they've grown up with all this, but looking at their generation of work, they want, you know, e either they want your psychedelic wow factor stuff, which is quite abstract in some ways, but it does, it, it's all manufactured in a sort of like a firework explosion of colors and uh, forms, or they want soft realism. There's a lot of soft realism around these days uh, of stuff which clearly doesn't interest me. So I'm an old hard nut that basically makes this sort of stuff and I, you know, I can't stop, I cannot stop making it. I just carry on doing it. And if things get tired in the studio, I think I'll just find another way of going somewhere else. Well, but clearly there's a demand for it. Um, you work a lot in Italy um, and, you know, going to a more you know into a more pragmatic sense we were looking at these um public spaces um but there is um acquiring your wall drawings um and having them in in the home so we've seen quite a few examples in the um, in the images um scrolling um how does it work how do you sell a wall drawing and um how does wh what freedom 
does the collector have with it um, in the sense of, you know, if they move house or if they go somewhere else, do they have to call you or, or your um, fabulous assistant to remake it? And um, what will happen in the future? Well, do they get a certificate, for example, and instructions? Everybody gets the original drawing. For example, in Suli, you will have the original drawing, which is in effect the certification of the work. Uh, of naturally, the works which you hope uh, or you want to uh, be made are works which will last forever. So in Suli, will work, I hope, forever. Tate was a different question because they unfortunately had We're a sort talking of... talking about Tate Britain. Tate Britain um, had, had a structure in the building where they could do it. They could give me five years and they said, we'll see what we can do. For f they were not permitted to have it permanently. So sadly, I had to accept that as a... Bloomberg, for example, is something which uh, is commissioned by a big uh, corporation. But the thing about corporation buildings is that, yeah, they are permanent, but corporations don't last forever. And some days they disappear. Uh, and therefore, bye-bye, you know, the wall drawing goes down. The only ones I can tell you which will last, in my view, forever are the churches and the aristocrats. <laughs> they both work. So I sell to one or two aristocrats, they put it into their collection, that is passed on to the next generation. These are successful aristocrats, of course. The, they work, and the churches work. So the stained glass in Villeneuve, uh, and even these little chapels which we've been doing, the Barolo Chapel in Italy, and the ones in Switzerland, and these have a sort of covenant on it for reparation and repair, and all the materials are there, and they technically work forever. And they have the blessing of the priest and all that sort of stuff, and unless they're bombed, they will last. But the rest, I'm at the mercy of the gods, so... It how did you develop such a relaxed relationship with the potential disappearing of your work in such a, in such a strong manner? Because you, you've chosen this medium. I'm not a sentimentalist in the end. <laughs> I accept life is one of these things which, you know, we're all going to go away one day and can happen with work. You, you hope it lasts. I mean, that's the... That's your sort of optimism and your future is that it, it will last, but uh, I accept the fact that things can disappear. You, you have, like those old ruined buildings, these chaps, they can disappear, which they did. Uh, and, and that's the balance of life, I think. I was thinking of Cornwall and where you lived, um, and I was wondering, you work a lot in the public space, you work a lot in rural spaces, these churches, they're in very remote areas. Does this kind of correct the way you were so isolated from the world and is it a way of revisiting that space where you, in the way you tell it, you were so naive and so out of touch with the rest of the world? But I just told you, I'm not a sentimentalist. No, no, I'm that, trying. that didn't, that doesn't hack. No, I mean, I love working in your, in your sort of, it's mainly Italy, of course, you know, because when you're in Italy, in the rural parts of Italy, and you have some nice little restaurant bar, which is, you can go and eat at lunchtime and uh, all that sort of stuff. Uh, it's, maybe that is the comfort that I, sort of had as a child, although, to be quite honest, I am of a generation that was born after, just after the Second World War, and it was pretty austere at that time. Things were seriously black and white. They were not at all colorful. But as a youngster, of course, you, you know, when I first heard Elvis Presley and Buddy Holly and all that rock and roll, oh, man, I was so happy to hear it, you know, as opposed to all that stuff my parents used to listen to. And, I can give you stories of, my father gave me a transistor radio as a present once, and on that transistor radio, you could fine tune it and you'd find Radio Luxembourg, which was a offshore sort of radio station, or the, the forces network in Germany for the soldiers. And there, if you really tuned in, you could hear Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, and all this stuff which was magic you know i'd never heard this wonderful american music because uh, vinyls didn't exist they weren't even around or they were but you had to go to london to get them so 
if I'm sentimental at all, it's about that. There's no nostalgia about yeah. a sort of original place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, David. Um, I was wondering, you know, if maybe someone in the audience had some questions for you, if you, um, you know, accept to hang around for just a little bit more, a bit longer. Um, does someone have any questions for David? Oh, yes, please. Of course. I don't know if I need this, I'm very loud. But um, I'm a sculptor also that ended up doing mostly drawing for the last 20 years. And the thing that's interesting to me is your use of color, which I can't even begin to deal with. It's like something about design and too many choices and eh, but you seem to have a super strong command of color. So where does that come from? And does that relate, how does that, how could you verbalize that that relates to your sculptural sensibility? That's well, that's a good question. I, I mean, as you, as it starts, it, it all starts with graphite. You draw with your gray graphite. You, you're, you're sketching with a, you don't sketch with color. I didn't, it was only black and white, bit of ink sometimes and black and white. And then there was this transition to certain colors which were pretty earthy. Browns, grays could come into it, bit of green, but they all seem to have a link to the soil, to the, to the landscape, to something relatively natural. And I sort of utilized them, you know, or, or even the color of bricks and things you might see in a building but not your primary colors, nothing strong or anything like that. So there was a transition from gray, graphite, uh, pencil, to this coloring which was more natural in the sort of earthy sense of things. And then there's a <clears throat> point where I think uh, you have to change. It's like I needed to move away from it somehow. And so I would introduce the, the next tone up. And then the final thing ends up as nearly primary as colors. Uh, it was very natural. Uh, and I was able to form a, a good logical reason for doing it. I, it's more or less what I've just said to you. I, it, it was a progression which was intuitive, but was influenced clearly by things you're seeing and all these sorts of things, but it went from black and white to color through a process of, uh, to, so people like Solowit, he never really used those earthy colors, which I often use. That's why we got on quite well at, when he was alive, because basically we had that sort of interesting dialogue between him using a lot more primary and me not. As I get older, I found myself using more primary not strictly primary, but quite. And now I see I'm curving off again. I'm going back. I've just done a chapel down in, a chapel in uh, Pavia. And these have gone back into a sort of strange grays and off-whites and all that. So there's a sort of parabolic thing going on sometimes with color. Uh, Do you think it's grounded conceptually? Or aesthetically, like in your, in your mind? I think it's probably conceptually in the sense that I need to sort of, I push myself to think, what am I going to do next? Where, how do I move it in another way? Uh, I mean, COVID was a pretty interesting period. I mean, you're stuck at home and the studio was great. I managed to go through a whole lot of cleaning up and cataloging and stacking and storing and photographing. So I spent, you know, several months doing that. And then I got back to work and I started to draw. I don't know if you've got any of those last drawings there, uh, which were these sort of spiky things that, I mean, Julia's got I wanted two of them in. They're, they're in the booth, the, the, Julia yeah. has some upstairs. I suddenly, if we could find one, I'd love to show it to you. If it's, uh, are these early drawings here or not? Uh, the later, sorry, the later drawings. Oh, no. This like I sent you on that uh, PDF. No, I think we only have ah, okay. up to 2020. So uh, I think there was a point when in, in COVID, which I said, uh, you know, I, I got to a point where I'd done all this archiving work and I hadn't actually done any drawing for, say, three months, and I have to get back to it. And I'd found myself looking at, at a grid 
and then what do I do inside this grid? And I started doing some drawings which were very spiky. They looked like chromosomes almost, exploded chromosomes, but they were very geometric. They weren't just uh, what I was sort of explaining in sort of psychedelic sense. They were extremely calculated drawings. And I'd never done them before. Uh, and the colors were far less vivid. They were muted. Maybe that had something to do with COVID, I don't know. I wouldn't want to say COVID was something that was going to affect me, but I think it did. I think it affected everybody in different ways. And for me, it was something that put me back into a conceptual frame of mind as opposed to an aesthetic frame of mind. I was not looking for anything beautiful necessarily or ugly or anything like that. I was looking at something which was this expression of time. And they have a sort of interesting time side to them, I think. I'm sorry we haven't got one here. Yeah. I gave you a whole bunch of them, but just, you know. Really bad. <laughs> you, Thanks I, for asking. We have to we have to send everyone to the to the gallery to see the drawings. Is there any are there any other questions? Um, yes. Uh, shall we be allowed to come and see you working in the Hotel de Sully? Tomorrow there is a a visit. I so don't... if you speak with Joanna. She'll oh, um, arrange whatever's necessary. Thank you. I don't promise an awful lot. You, you'll, you'll see all the scheme. You just started. But there's no colors going in yet. But the, uh, what will be made is up on the wall so you can see how it's going to be. But uh, oh no, I, that's going to be an interesting one to do. Very, very interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a good evening. I want to